tuned in to the Shockwaves video cast presented by Bob Malbandian. Host of the Shockwaves slash Hard Radio podcast on hardradio.com and the Shockwaves Skull Sessions podcast on roadrunnerrecords.com slash Skull Sessions. Shockwaves video cast. We got the one and only Mr. Lips from Anvil. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. All right, here at the Coach House in San Juan Capistrano, Orange County. First time here at the Coach House? Absolutely. All right, how's it going to feel playing to a seated audience? That's probably uh... It's going to feel like <laughs> my many, many years playing in Canada. Ah, like the bar mitzvah you played for. Then. Well, no, <laughs> no, that's the way the clubs are in Canada. Oh, generally, are. Uh, generally speaking, all the clubs that we played all through the early years were all like that. Wow. Well, you know, the early years here in uh, L.A. too, I was just talking to someone. I mean, I used to go to the, the Whiskey and the Troubadour, and those were all seated. I mean, you oh, see, I, didn't, I didn't know oh, that. Oh, yeah, you would see bands like Wasp and Blackie would be throwing meat, and you'd be seated trying to duck and cover. I mean, yeah. It was just till, you know, uh, like probably mid-'80s that uh, they started, or early to mid-'80s they started yeah. pulling out the seats in a lot of the clubs. This one kind of remained. They don't do too many metal bands here, but it uh, should be a good show tonight. That's a, do they allow the people to get up? Yeah, sure, we're going to get up, whether they allow us or not. I mean, so. like, in, in, in our early years, like as an example, there was a very well-known club called the Gasworks. And in mm -hmm. fact, that's where we eventually got our record deal, and that's where the co company came down. With Attic? Yeah. yeah. And just as an example, and it's a great, it, kind of an unbelievable story, of course, we packed the place, right. and our early fans, like guys like Cut Loose, were there. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and Mad Dog, the guy who drinks yeah. beer through his nose. <laughs> and one night, actually, they were there. We used to play week stints at this club, and Mad Dog got up from his table during our set and started losing it. Right. Three bouncers grabbed him and beat him to a pulp. Oh, wow. Like basically, really beat him up to cut him, cut him open. Oh, Jesus. And Sebastian Bach actually took him to the hospital. Oh, really? That's right. He was Canadian. He was. Yeah, because uh, Sebastian was, used to also come out right. to, to our shows, and he was there that night. And when Colin got beat up, he took him, drove him to the hospital. Wow. Well, and they, the bouncers were real strict here, when like at the country club and the early shows uh, in L.A. Uh, not to get off subject, but they, you know, if people were slamming or, or stage diving. They'd throw you out and beat you up pretty good, and uh, you know. Uh, but after well, they just wait just, for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. You know, they're bullies. Basically, yeah, yeah. you wouldn't be a bouncer if you weren't a bully anyway. So true. Yeah. But then, you know, as soon as the thrash metal scene started and all that, they, you know, a lot of those bands, they, they, they had to play outside of L.A. and all different weird venues in South Central and go out to Tijuana to do shows and stuff, you know, back in the... Well, I, you know, for, for, for Anvil, we haven't been down here. Yeah. We missed all of that. Well, you know, I was going to ask you, because I was a long-time fan. I picked up the Hard and Heavy record right when it came out. I was a kid. I saw that album. It's like, yeah, look at this. Check these guys out. Picked it up. And that album was pretty readily available because that was into all the new wave of British heavy metal and you know all those you know great bands you know I mean, you had you know Motorhead was out domestically but a lot of the imports you know of course Iron Maiden was domestic and a, and a few others but you know Angel Witch and uh, Raven and all those who were unimported you know yours was a Canadian import it's a little bit easier to to find and uh, uh, picked up that album and was totally blown away and up through Forge and Fire which I actually think is is, is the best album love that album. Um, Anvil never toured at the States. I mean, I know you did some selective shows in New York, but in Los yeah, they, Angeles... No, we never, no, we never, never did. Why, why is that then? Because there was Cause such yeah, a demand. Didn't, we didn't have a record deal down here. Well, I mean, uh, well, I mean, a lot of bands, well, I, like I said, it was pretty well uh, available here. I mean, a lot of people had that album, and you could have... It was all, it was seen, all, all done by on import into the States. There, was, there wasn't an agent in existence that would have booked us. Right. Really? That's surprising. We had we had no there's no tourist support, no nothing. Yeah. How are you gonna do it? Well you know How are you gonna go five thousand miles? No, you know, it's who's well, paying for it? I know, but you know, I you, you see you know bands like fellow Canadians, Exciter, they came down with Merciful Fate, you know Slide uh, to Combat. 
True. Uh, Mega, I think that was shrapnel at the time. Well, no, maybe it was Megaforce. I think that was. Yeah, you're right. They did have it. Loudness came down before they were with Atlantic. A lot of bands did come. Merciful Fate came down. We with, didn't come Saturday. down in L.A. till we actually got signed by Metal Blade. I remember that when you played The Waters, I believe. That's yeah. right. That we was pound for pound. Our, recorded our live album. Yeah. But I'm just saying that as a fan's point of view, because that was like, I know a lot of fans were going, where's Anvil, man? We want to see this band live, you know? But uh, it's good to see you. Yeah, fine. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> the past is the past, and you can't do anything to change it. Sure, sure. The reasons that the things, yeah. the, the the music business failed us. Brutal. Yeah, yeah. Brutal. That, I mean, that's basically what happened. We got signed to an independent, independent record label, and you know, greed is the name of the game. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, the American labels were interested, but they wanted all their first three albums for nothing. Right, right. Why would a Canadian company has gone into debt paying for these records want to give away the records for free? Now, they to didn't. this day, they still haven't reissued that or they haven't given it. I know you're doing a SPV, I believe, just reissued or is reissuing like a pound for yeah. pound. Oh, yeah, they're re steel. yeah, but no, they, they, won't, the they won't be able to get the attic stuff. The yeah. attic stuff is locked, locked, locked in, lock and key. Wow. Gone because of the kind of record deal it was really? to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know you did like a, an anthology, which, you know, you put all those old, a lot of the older songs on. Yeah. You just put out a new Greatest Hits, right? Yeah, or, now that anthology was a licensing deal that we actually did with Attic. Mm -hmm. They charged us a bloody fortune. Yeah. Um, it had really poor distribution. Right. Uh, you could kind of find it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It yeah, was yeah, one yeah. of those kind of things. And uh, eventually, of course, the licensing deal went away. Mm. You used up. That's a shame, It's only man. good for a certain length of time. So we put out an, another one. Yeah. Well, cool. Now, what was the Canadian scene like back then? Back in the, uh, going into the late 70s, into the early 80s. Uh, we were in an, um, a total anomaly. Mm. Well, there are so many great Canadian bands that really have, I mean, uh, and the musicianship from Canadian musicians, I mean, long before, you know, Sweden and all these other countries were known for great musicians. I mean, you know, you, of course, had uh, Anvil, of course, and, you know, Frank Marino, Pat Travers, of course, Rush, uh, April Wine, um, you know, especially the guitar players, brilliant, uh, you know, musicianship, uh, uh, Triumph, Rick Emmett. Um, was that uh, a big thing with, uh, was there a big, like, a school or something for musicians? Uh, no, man, it you? was, we were... I mean, if when basically, in order to get, in order to have gotten a record deal or anything like that in Canada, you had to be really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So only the cream of the crop, only the cream rose to the top. Right. right. It basically, is the way that it ended up. Uh, you know, so very, very difficult to get anywhere in Canada. There's virtually no support for their own their own talent. Right. Well, I noticed a lot of bands uh, during that era, uh, a lot of people don't realize this from, you know, the late 70s on through the early 80s, not only Canada, but in the U.S., they were really doing hardly anything for metal. And bands like Anvil had to go to England, as well as bands like Twisted Sister, Riot, Y&T. Well, that's, that's where we made our first impression. Uh, first yeah, because you had magazines first. like Kerrang! and yeah. Art Shock from Holland and stuff that were that's right. very supportive, uh, where, you know, American, the U.S., and there wasn't, there, there wasn't, there was no, there. there was no such thing. Yeah, yeah. Metal didn't really happen sure. in America till 1983. Yeah. Well, even when Metallica first came out, when they did the demos and all, they were getting all their press. Uh, England well, it's interesting because it's all the all the roads led to the same place. Right. Um, it's interesting because Glenn is just reading the, um, Dave Mustaine's. I heard him in the uh, background there. Yeah. And it's interesting <laughs> hearing the hearing the. Our distant relatives of what they went through, and it's uh, and the same. It's all the same people. It's all the same players. Sure. Because that's who was, there was at that time. There was no one else. Yeah. So you wanted to come out in the United States. There was only one guy, Johnny Z. Right. You know, um, Slagle. We got we got well. Yeah, Slagle. Slagle was, in my opinion, after Johnny Z. Yeah, a little bit. Really, not quite as. He didn't have the. The uh, finances, I think, that Johnny Z. Well, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny time. was was. It, it was interesting because Johnny launched his his career by himself in a, in a flea market. Yeah, the, the rock route, and roll heaven. Route, route eight, on Route 18 in, in New Jersey. Yeah, and uh, I guess it must have been just 
after Metal on Metal came out and maybe a week or two before we went to England mm. for our first time that we got booked, Johnny booked us in the flea market. Oh really? Yeah, huh. that was his first show and that was his first... Well, I didn't know this. Well, I'm, just, I'm telling you, <laughs> yeah, what, what, this, this, is all for me. Pre, this is all pre, boys and this girls. is all pre Metallica and all yeah. that stuff. This is before he even knew that there was a Metallica. Right. Um, he called. He got in touch with our record company because he'd been selling lots of metal on metal and hard and heavy records out of his record store in the flea market. And he goes, I'm, "I wonder what it would take to get this band down here, right? And just to play in the flea market." Mm. So we came down, he had us come down, and very, very, it was amazing. I mean, there was probably 2,000 people there. Uh, wow. It was really like the first metal show ever. Yeah. Like that they called metal. Yeah. And That's how Anvil was big out here back in the day. I mean, all the um, true metal. Yeah, it, it, it was really, it was, it was shocking, man. Yeah. It was a, really remarkable. Um, you know, we met all of our friends all the very very dear friends that are still friends to this day all the all the what we call the metal militia right the jersey New metal jersey. militia boys yeah. those are all our friends and they're all actually that's and I'll, I'll go on to explain what happened we were signed to that record label johnny wanted to get his hands on us right. he wanted he want, i mean this was the very beginnings he wasn't in a position to do it but i can remember coming off stage and johnny was Freaking out. Yeah. He's going, the magic is here. I can feel it. I know the future. I can see the future. And he's just losing his mind. He goes, I'm I'm gonna bring metal to the United States. This is it. This is it. I'm I know what I, what my mission is. Right. You know, like he's freaking out, like you know, so he was pretty very, very cool, very really good guy. Um as of course time moved on, we went and did England. Uh that's where we met. I mean, that's where we met the guy who made the movie. Sasha, it yeah. was on that trip. At the marquee. Right? At the marquee. So we come back, and then I guess after it must have been a year, we'd done the Forge of Fire album. They, we had a show in Staten Island, a Halloween bash. With Riot, Raven, and, the, and us. And you guys. Yeah. I remember reading about that. Um, Jealous that I couldn't make the trip. Yeah, out we. There. You know, I, Johnny calls me and goes, can you bring some extra cabinets? So there was a band, Kraken, that I'd been working with. Oh, yeah. Doing, band, uh, yeah, that doing uh, yeah. Uh, some record. I, I was producing some of their stuff. So a I brought very down, rare album. Good album, too, if you can so get I your brought, hands on it. I, I, brought down, I brought down the guitarist's Marshall cabinets right. with us so that the guys in Raven could use them. Oh, cool. And we went to play the show, and Riot had a really, really nasty 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 uh, road crew mm -hmm. and of course they were the big New York band and we were the support bands right. um, we went on first uh, Ross the boss was there I still remember that of war days yeah <laughs> um, we went on first it was okay it was okay it wasn't a very long set I think it was like 40 minutes or something like that and then they had Raven go up and what what happened was it, the road crew started screwing around with all the microphone feeds. Mm. So the, they used to happen a lot back then to the old So bands. our sound man was doing sound for Raven and I'm back at the board and he's going, I can't find John's vocal. Mm. And he's like lifting all the faders. John the guy, her. Yeah, he can't, like they, they pulled the, you know, like there's a big snake and a big junction of where all the mics plug in. Right. And the guy's just flip, 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 flip. Good luck sound man. Yeah. And then so he doesn't know where, so poor. So a sabotage from the road. Crew. Yeah, oh yeah, it was just brutal, yeah. brutal. That um, happened a lot in the LA li days. Limita too. Limitations on the PA system, yeah, yeah. turning down all the power amps. Um, it just not good stuff. Luckily, they didn't give us as bad a time, but Raven had a rough time that night. Yeah. Of course, that really infuriated me because we'd gone through all this trouble. I brought all this equipment for them. I I was, you know, to me Raven were like brethren. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's oh, these. Are, you know what I'm saying? There was a, we had an instant an instant connection with each other. And well, uh, I just spoke with John uh, Gallagher not too long ago. Did a little interview when we talked about the Anvil days and stuff. And yeah, and, and and we're still we're still friends. <laughs> and it's interesting. Um, 
all the people that were there, some of the interviews, I mean, there was a magazine called Kick-Ass Monthly. Yeah, Bob Maldoni. Bob came into the change room and we did right. a whole interview and I talked about never selling out. And he wrote, the, the article was called uh, Fuck Money, Give Me Metal. Yeah, which is was what that's was, total Bob. Yeah. Th well, no, it was that's what. Oh, was that you? Yeah, that's yeah. me. Yeah. You know? So it's like <laughs> I couldn't believe he called the article out because I, I just started talking about uh, Joan Jett uh, buying hits, right? And becoming a pop pop singer and a pop band. I found found that very upsetting and right. saying that I really don't really really against that. You yeah, got to yeah. be natural if it's going to happen. It's got to happen by accident, on purpose. If you're going to make it big, and I just thought that it was you know when you start focusing on trying to be big, it's not the same as naturally writing a song. Right. No, absolutely. You know, you're writing a song to make your money. There's there's something not right about that. You're not yeah. writing the song to make a great song. You're writing the song to make money. That's I, 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 don't, I find those things very, very incong incongruent and mm -hmm. not acceptable. And the whole article was all about never selling out. And it's interesting to read it today because you go, and look at that. <laughs> that philosophy was there prevalent, very, very prevalent at that point in my career, and it never changed. Yeah. And as a result of that attitude, it kept me in obscurity for 30 years. Yeah. Because but, uh, underground, I underground. Say, I want to say, but but obscured. but to understand that it's where I wanted to be. Yeah. And if you read the article, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. Yeah. 